Welcome everyone to the 30-minute Midas Touch from beautiful Dyersburg, Tennessee at the Herb Welsh Wrestleplex. Now, here is pound for pound and inch for inch, the best of the best in professional wrestling today. A wrestling genius worth his weight in gold. The Golden Boy, Greg Anthony. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the 30-minute Midas Touch. I am your host, the Golden Boy, Greg Anthony. And with me, as always, is my my lovely co-host. Oh, lovely. <laughs> well, you know, I, I try to add as many adjectives okay, yeah. as I can sometimes. Uh, my co-host, none other than the mad scientist, oh. Mark Tipton. Oh, the mad scientist. I do. I like that one as well. Um, although it does evoke visions of Paul Heyman, the mad scientist of extreme or whatever. But uh, I do appreciate that. I like that one. As I do enjoy looking forward to what moniker I'm going to gain this week, the mad scientist is certainly a nice one. This edition of the 30 Minute Mice Touch podcast is one that uh, I won't be able to offer much direct uh, commentary on. But for those of you listening, uh, to explain how this is a roundabout way to get into our subject, but uh, recently the Oscars took place, uh, you know, where movie awards are handed out. One of the aspects of the Oscars that uh, came to be well known about the presentation of the Oscars was the red carpet as the, you know, the nominees and so forth made their way in. It was a bit of a fashion show to see who could have on what and so forth. And they were often critiqued on what they were. And we, in this edition, are going to do a pro wrestling version of that, so to speak. We're going to be discussing ring gear and its importance and uh, to professional wrestling. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, like, you know, like you said with the Oscars, not not only red carpet obviously, but they actually have awards and movies for for costume design and things like that. And and wrestling is is very similar in that aspect, you know. Um <clears throat> professional wrestling, you know, um you know, obviously it's it's based in a in an athletic contest, but you know, uh, eventually it, it morphed into, well, you know, this is a this is a show business kind of thing. So let's make it as extravagant as we can. And there's been a, a lot of really creative things that come off that some really great things, some really bad things, but you know, we're a long way away from the old wool tights yes. that, that, that were took place in the fifties <clears throat> and the sixties. But, um, you know, gear plays a huge role in not only, um, your presentation, but the presentation of your company, the presentation of your, in some cases, even your match, because, you know, imagine just for an example, if 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 Ryback wore uh, a speedo, like an actual speedo, yes. you know what I mean? Like it wouldn't have the same effect as him in the singlet. No, see, see what I'm saying it would become comical. Thank you for the mental image. Yeah, no. yeah. But like that's what I'm saying. There, there's a lot of things that you know. The the reason they wear certain things is because of of you know uh, like. Ric Flair is another one, for instance. You know, a lot of people talked about how how cool it was that he used to wear his knee pads on his shins. Like everyone used to mimic that too. They oh, I'm wearing my knee pads on my shins, like like Flair. Um, well, Flair did that because he had small calves and he was trying to hide his calves, right? So for the most part, that's what that's what the reason he was doing that. So a lot of these things all play in together. All right, so it's fair to say that because professional wrestling is entertainment much like in the movies or other forms of entertainment, the presentation is important. And you mentioned about the the older professional wrestling, well, I think in the 50s and so forth. Oftentimes when I see tapes from there, unless I, sp- I have to kind of struggle to see who is who, the, they wear basically the similar outfits. And r- with uh, differentiating your ring gear allows you to stand out, which is certainly important to an entertainer. Is that fair to say? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, the you want to be unique, but at the same time, like I said, you want to follow whatever story you're trying to tell. Like, w- when we're telling our stories, it, it always starts with character first. Like, what would you, as, like, for instance, me, what would the Golden Boy Greg Anthony do? The reason that the Golden Boy Greg Anthony wears singlets is because I was always 
the wrestler wrestler guy coming up you know what i mean so it made sense for me to wear a singlet and i was never going to be in wwe shape as i say so you know it was a way for me to look professional without you know going out there with my gut hanging out and things like that so it, it served a purpose you know um and that's the way a lot of people do, you know, it has to accommodate your particular body size, your t- particular body frame. You know, some people just don't look good in uh, long tights because maybe they have um, high hips or, you know, something like that. And it makes them look like they're, you know, they have a, <laughs> I have a three inch torso and, you know, you know, 12 foot legs, you know. So like uh, all those things kind of play in a factor. And you kind of have to have someone that knows wrestling and knows what it's supposed to look like and what it's supposed to feel like to kind of give you an outside perspective sometimes of what looks good or what will work. All right. As I said, uh, I'm a, maybe a poor person to d- discuss this subject because I'm someone who's never laced a pair of wrestling boots in his life. Although I have, you know, certainly watched my fair share of matches, but, uh, speaking of wrestling boots, let, let's just start there. Uh, we refer to, uh, uh, let me think. One of the uh, taglines that you've used here is uh, grassroots and wrestling boots. Now, obviously, wrestling boots are the foundation uh, for many people. However, not everyone in the ring actually wears what I would refer to as wrestling boots. Would you like to comment on that? Yeah, obviously, you know, uh, a lot of people wear what's called um, amateur wrestling shoes. <clears throat> wrestling shoes and then they wear kick pads a lot of times over them um i'm much more a fan i surprise surprise traditionalist greg anthony is much more of a fan of actual wrestling boots you know just because i think that that as uh is always going to be the standard in professional wrestling um but yeah but the ch- a, a cheaper option is is the the wrestling shoes because you can get the wrestling shoes for 30 40 bucks and then you kick pads you can find kick pads for 50 60 bucks you know what i mean so under 100 bucks you know and you've got you've got your you've got your uh, footwear taken care of as to where if you buy boots i mean i have one pair of boots that's almost 500 dollars. you know what i mean i have you know some of my other pairs are two three hundred you know somewhere in there and i've had over the course of 21 years i've had four or five pairs of boots you know so it's not you know they don't you know they last a pretty good long time considering how much i wrestle and things like that um i always had trouble at a high spots boots because high spots boots for some reason they would they would the eyelets would tear and the things like that very easily so i i haven't used them in, a, in a many many years but um some of the bigger named uh boot makers did a very well job all right <clears throat> all right well let's if you indulge me a little bit on the wrestling boots a little bit, one of the things I've always suspected is when you think of the traditional wrestling boots, they usually go at least up um, mid of your calf, sometimes higher depending on the wrestler. But I've always thought, is there a function to that in, in terms of support for your feet in some fashion? Rather than just because the traditional boots go up higher, is that is there a purpose behind that beyond the look itself? Uh, yeah, I mean, it was it was to basically, get, like you said, give support. You know, here we are, we're professional wrestling, we're jumping around, things like that. So, yeah, there's like, now boots obviously used to be a little shorter. You know, they used to be like right below the calf. You know, and I'm not, I'm not sure who, it had to been in the 70s. Um, somebody got the longer boots, you know what I mean, that I remember. It could have been the 60s. I mean, it could have, yeah. it could have been one of the, well, sure. should have, could, could have been one of the old, uh, the old Nazi gimmicks or, Somebody well, like that, yeah. you know, some of the, a Vaughn somebody. Yeah, I'm trying to remember. It seemed like Jimmy Valiant tended to wear rather high boots. Yeah. He yeah. did. And that was some, for whatever reason, he's one of them that sticks out in my mind for doing that. Because I, when I picture well, him that, in the now ring. That, now that you say that, I think, I think it almost became like long tights, long boots. Okay. Because, you know, now that you're saying that, I'm thinking back. And like most people that had long boots like that actually wore long tights as well. You know, and then people that wore the trunks usually had kind of the shorter boots all right and maybe that's something maybe it's not well you know it could be right could be right could be wrong just a just a and healthy indeed. theory well one of the other aspects of wrestling boots is the lack of tread on the bottom now i i've always gathered that has a practical purpose because when you're in the ring on the canvas that's great the place i've always seen this come and 
and it stood out to me is when matches make their way outside the ring because sometimes the treads become an issue is that fair to say yeah well when you're running on you know in a wrestling ring you're running on a canvas you know and it's padded a, a little bit obviously um so the whole point of not having treads is so your your foot doesn't get stuck mid whatever Right, so it doesn't. So you're, it's pliable enough to where you can move around. Right, so if you go to plant and maybe, you know, you don't turn like you're supposed to and you blow your knee out. You see, that's the, that's the reason we don't have tread treads on the bomber feet. That and you're kicking people, obviously, and you don't want to kick somebody and leave a tread on their face. You know, <laughs> you know, legitimately. Yeah, but I mean. <laughs> Yeah, that could be a problem. Yeah, yeah. But like you said, then on the, and that's where you have to be careful when you do wrestle on the outside. If it gets slick or anything like that and you have no tread. Well, somebody has spilled their Coke on the arena yeah, floor. Yeah, exactly. I mean, we, we've all had it. And here at the Herb Walsh Wrestleplex, you know, uh, during the summer, you know, our floor will sweat. You know, because concrete floor will sweat. And it'll, you know, it's, it becomes a hazard. So we try to keep most things in the ring during that time frame. But, um, yeah, boots are um, – you know, they have – all those things have practical purposes. You know, like um, the one thing that bothers most people about wrestling boots is is the lacing the wrestling boots because it's, it's time-consuming to lace and unlace your boots each time. <laughs> it really is. So, uh, like Bill Dundee one time talked about how, you know, it's, that's why he that's why he went to the slip-on boots because he wears, like, the cowboy style sure. where he just slips them on. That's the reason he – because he's tired of fucking – well, Lace yeah. boots, so he, he <laughs> decided to get the slip-ons, and he, I'm never fucking worried about it yeah. again. Yeah, then you're done without that. And, and in fairness, uh, lots of the kind of Western-based wrestlers, I, I think of, the first one that comes to mind for me is Dusty Rhodes. Uh, he actually incorporated his boot into the bunkhouse stampede where you would receive a cowboy boot full of cash yep. and that kind of thing. His boots were part of his, and he always had very distinct boots. Yeah, Barry Windham. But there you go. Uh, yeah, they, they all have them. You know, obviously, even and that's something like we talk about. There's a blueprint for everything out there, and that and that's the blueprint for a cowboy right there. They have to have those boots. You know, what I mean, you can't tell me you're a cowboy gimmick. You know, what I mean, and not have some version of those. Even James Storm has a version of that, I and mean, he originally had that. You know, what I mean, so like um, even our our gunslinger Cody James here, he has those boots. You know what right. I mean? So, I mean, it's, it's, it's one of those things like, and that's what we're talking about, you know, your gear tells part of your story, you know, so that, and that's part of the story. All right. One of the things that has come up around, and I'm, I'm going longer on boots than I, I thought I would. One of, and this has been a criticism I've heard leveled at people and, or maybe advice uh, given to people I've known in and around the wrestling business in that having wrestling boots kind of gives you an appearance of professionalism yeah is that fair yeah it is i mean and that's and that was the thing like back in the day day you know you weren't if you didn't have a pair of wrestling boots you weren't wrestling now they may let you borrow a pair but i mean at the same time if you came in and said i'm a wrestler and then you put on whatever you know they weren't going to let you wrestle unless you were a barefoot gimmick like snooker or tojo or something like that but like um you know, the, the boots themselves, yeah, yeah it, it means, hey, I kind of, I made it. You know, that kind of thing. That was, I remember my first pair, of, my first pair of boots, actually, this is funny. I loved Shane Douglas so much. Really? My first pair of boots actually had fringe on. Ah. Yellow fringe. Okay. So, so and um, I had those on my boots for probably a year, year and a half, and then I, then I eventually took the fringe off of them. But, um, my, yeah, my first pair of boots, my custom order pair of boots from High Spots, like we were talking about, I I had yellow fringe. All right. Uh, that is something, because wrestling boots are kind of unique, they're not something you would see anywhere else. So I've always thought when, I, when I'm in the audience and I see someone walk out with those, it fits in that arena. It kind of says, hey, this is. Yeah. And so it fits into that. Also with that too, though, is not only boots are just more protective. Like the wrestling shoes as as lightweight and stuff as they are, like when you go to when you get thrown to the outside or you hit your heel in one of those, it hurts a lot more. So okay. I, when you when you actually have a an actual physical leather padded boot kind of thing, you know, uh padded, it's not really padded, but you know what I mean, it's got the large sole on it. Um then it's it it tends to take a a much better licking. <laughs> All right. Well, 
let me ask, um, how do you feel about when people in, uh, use really tennis shoes uh, in there? Now, the one of them that comes to mind that I felt really worked, and this is a name I may cite uh, again, uh, and that's the case of John Cena. Now, in John Cena's case, when he came to the ring, he became known for pumping up, pump yeah. up his shoes. It was kind of part of his presentation. Uh and do you think it fit, A, the way he performed in the ring, as as well as his character he created? Yeah, that whole, you know, Dr. Thug, Thugonomics thing, I mean, he wasn't – it has to fit, like we talked about. So, I mean, he wasn't going to have, you know, come out in the throwback jerseys and the jorts and, you know, the chains and all that kind of stuff, and all of a sudden he just has traditional wrestling boots on like everyone else on the roster. He was completely different than everyone else on the roster, so he had to be completely different. So, like, him coming out and wrestling in, uh, in Jordans or whatever it was or the pump-ups like you're talking about were the Reebok. I think they were Reeboks. Yeah. Um, whatever that may be, that that was part of his presentation. It was a smart idea too. I mean, you know, incorporating if because he he was a traditional guy. Like his original gear, he wore you know biker shorts and wrestling boots, yes. right? And the, he apparently he had bought like every color imaginable. So he had like every color tights and every color boot to match his tights, right? That's how how you know how a uh, gun ho he was about all of it. So uh, for him to go, well, if I'm gonna have to wear shoes. You know what I mean? Let's let's make it mean something. And he, you know, did the pump-up thing. All right. And I suppose for a visual, it is, as though he wore those, I tried to imagine, well, could I ever imagine Kurt Angle wearing something like that? Well, you know, Kurt Angle did wear wrestling. He wore shoes that were very similar to that in TNA. Okay. Like he he had, he went away from his his long boots like he normally did, and actually went to some actual like just plain white, uh, and they weren't even really wrestling shoes. They were more like, um, like I said, like Reebok kind of style shoes. You'd have to look at them to see, but like, but that was one of those things for for Kurt Angle. It worked because he's Kurt Angle. <laughs> you know what I mean? But like, um, yeah, he he switched from the long boots to something like that. Like I said during the TNA run, middle of the TNA run, I think. All right, I'd like to move to something a little bit, uh, let's say, more flashy and and kind of stand out more. You mentioned the Nature Boy Ric Flair. Now, Ric Flair and fashion is is something that, uh, in my mind, goes hand in hand. But he, along with several others, uh, kind of brought into vogue. Well, I couldn't say he did. There were people that did it long before he did. But I'm thinking about the ring robe. It's yeah. something that's not tremendously in fashion now you do see it from time to time but he is one who is most famous for it would you like to talk about robes and rick flair among others the importance they play in the presentation yeah i mean those were huge deals you know like when you saw flair come out or uh tully or you know uh, mr wonderful paul warndorf and there was just a plethora of guys that had those ring jackets like that and those those long robes and um flares were by far in my opinion the most extravagant Everyone else's were kind of, you know, even Luger had some, but it was like just a black and silver kind of thing, I think, or black and red or whatever it may be. But flares were really over the top and with the feathers and the, and the rhinestones and, and designs and, you know, just, just all the the whole presentation of it. So, and that begs to differ. Could he have been the Nature Boy Ric Flair? Could he have been the, the limousine riding, jet flying, wheeling, dealing, kiss dealing, son of a gun if he came out in like a blue jean jacket? Right, it just didn't. It wouldn't have fit, right? No, it didn't. But since he said that, and he came out, and he had he had the robes, and he had the seven girls with him, and he was the world champion, and he said he was a sixty minute man, and he meant wrestling, but he didn't really mean wrestling. He meant well, in the bedroom later. Yeah, that, <laughs> well, the, well, there were often allusions to Space Mountain, right? Exactly. And he wasn't necessarily describing a roller coaster, right? Yes, we all understand that. And I he, need, said, he said it was the oldest ride in the park, but it had the longest line. Yes. Uh, <laughs> I need to maybe I need to move to something else. Uh, my admiration for Ric Flair and his promos is to those who know me. I, I can't go on that for some time. Another example of this, and when I thought about you know, when we just mentioned robes, one other vision that flashed my mind. I'll see see what your opinion on this is. One of them I absolutely adored was the use of robes by the macho man Randy Savage. I can still see the image. He would always come out with his arms far to either side. Yeah, his was more like a like a robe cape. Yeah, it was it was very unique and and like the way that he used to, 
utilize because he wanted it to be like you said like a big open canvas almost you know and then he would have macho man written on it or have his logo the sunglasses sunglasses yes. or, or something like that so it's something really big visually to do that anyway now he he used to wear outrageous stuff like when he was in memphis and kentucky and places like that but when he went to wwf and this is Hogan talking. We, we, we've always talked about it, take stuff Hogan says with a grain of salt. But he says when Savage came in, you know, he said uh, he took him under his wing basically and found him the guy that made the robes and said, oh, he, we really need to give him some robes made, brother. You know, like that. So Hogan takes credit Ooh. a little bit for it. <laughs> he, he does say that, does he? He does. Uh, where, where would professional wrestling be, be without Terry Bollea? Uh In any event, I just always love those robes because they weren't, to me, they weren't exactly robes uh, because you could not – the arms were not clearly defined and they stood out. And I and I guess what I liked was it was – the way you described it, it was kind of like a billboard for himself. Yeah. Uh, he would come and spin around and it didn't look like anything else and stood out and they are always so bright and you could not ignore them. Yeah. And they were always rhinestoned or something. Yeah. And that's what we've always talked about. Wrestling itself is – you know, moves and athletic ability and all that kind of stuff aside, you know, it all comes down to, to being character and being somebody that someone can see and go, oh, wow, what's that? You know what I mean? And, like, you know, that Macho Man obviously had that wow factor. As crazy as he was, you know what I mean? Like, and then his gear was just as outlandish. You know what I mean? He's like, oh, he's the Macho Man. Look at him. You know what right. I mean? He, he looks like the Macho Man. Yeah, he just uh, oozed it, was, it. Right. It was just such a, a trademark for him that it it stands out to me. Um, if I could, I would kind of like to move more to ring gear as involved in the matches themselves, if I could. Uh, there are a couple of instances, and I can think of a couple of examples, to where items of apparel kind of became an intricate part of the match. Um, and one of them I'll cite, uh, well, let me get at, let's say gloves, for instance. Uh, there have been instances where you, the coal miner's glove on a pole. Yeah. Um and then there would be wrestlers who, when they put on a glove, they were about to do a particular move or something that was a signature for them, mm-hmm. um, and that kind of thing. Would you like to talk about things like that and how it can put, play into the the presentation to the audience? Yeah, like um, like you're talking about like the loaded glove kind of thing. Like, right. you know, the guy would hide the glove for the entire match, and all of a sudden he put the glove on. You know, and everybody, oh, shit, he's got the glove he's on. He's got the glove on. Thing, he knocked the guy out, one, two, three, and then, oh, I used the glove again. And eventually it would come to where the guy went to use the glove, and the baby face would back drop him out of it and take the glove, take off, the glove off, and then he would knock him out with it, you know what I mean, to get a little bit of redemption. Uh, but there's been all kinds of stuff like that, too. There's been, like, um, uh, even Greg the Hammer Valentine at a time had a sh- had the shin guard. The shin guard, yeah. And yes. he would turn the shin guard around to use it as the figure four. It's like, oh, he... he, he he broke his shin or whatever. He injured his shin somehow, so we're going to allow him to wear this shin guard in his matches, and then he would turn it around so he could use it on the figure four, and it would you know, it would obviously cause more damage. Right, and then it became an unfair advantage for, you know. And, I, there's, and there's a couple others, too. Like, the ones that don't really get remembered a lot, but, like, Luger and Bob Holly both had uh, the surgeries – where they, they had arm surgeries and they had metal plates in their yes. arm, and they used that as a finish. Now, okay. Bob Holly very briefly used it. Luger, they kind of alluded to it for, you know, a decade, but it really wasn't a huge thing. It wasn't like he knocked everybody out with it, but they would they would talk about how he had metal in that elbow from a motorcycle accident or something. So just to further along. All right. Well, I, I thought of this, and um, there was, for instance, one of the things uh, I – well, I thought of Dusty Rhodes again. There was a period of time, now he didn't do this always, but there was a long period of time where he would wear a red elbow pad on his right elbow. Right. Because what was he known for, of course, the bionic elbow. Right. And I love that presentation because then if he ever removed that thing, you're like, oh, no. Yeah. <laughs> now he's really going to get him. Yeah, and, yeah. and I really, as simple as that was, when he, if he removed that elbow and then delivered the, that, oh, no, that guy's dead. Right, he, right. <laughs> Is, and, and, and I love it. It just plays into the showmanship. Right. Could you say, let's say, um, well, a similar thing, uh, knee pads. I've often seen wrestlers will rem- lower their knee pad before they deliver a knee drop or something like that. 
is, are those sorts of things the things we're talking about here? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you use all that as part of your storytelling, you know. Like, Flair used to do that for years, too. Like I said, he kept his, his knee pads more around his um, calf because of the calf thing. But, um, yeah, he used to drop the knee without it, you know what I mean? And then every, every once in a while he'd miss it, and then the guy would put him in the figure four. And then that made sense, right? So, yeah, there, it's all these things kind of play in with each other, you know. All right. If I could, let it. I would like to turn back to John Cena. I mentioned I may come back to him. One of the great controversies and something I've gone back and forth on was, as silly as this is, John Cena, controversial as he is, one of the most controversial things was his in-ring apparel. Um, obviously, you mentioned he was known as he came up through OVW and so forth. He was known, I believe he was known as Cyborg uh, at that time. Or, prototype. Prototype, excuse me. <laughs> I, it was Cy- cyborg. It was it was something. Uh, he was kind. Of, it was almost it, it portrays kind of like a Terminator yeah, thing yeah. to me or something. Uh, and uh, as he came along, and for instance, when he made his debut against uh, Kurt Angle, he was in those biker shorts that you mentioned. Yeah. But then, kind of his trademark became the jorts, along with the t-shirt. And do you think that was a a good thing to do, or do you think it was something? That would just just because of the character he betrayed, you think? Yeah, I mean, and that's the thing. There's there's been plenty of of gimmicks that it wouldn't make sense for them to wear wrestling gear. Obviously, that John Cena based, uh, you know, thugonomics thing wouldn't have made sense for him to come out in just regular wrestling gear like everyone else, uh, because he would co- say he did come out in baseball jerseys, and then like the match would start, and he would just be in regular trunks and boots like everyone else, and then it, you know it loses appeal, but. Um, you know, obviously there's been stuff too, like, you know, um, Mr. Hughes, Mr. Hughes wrestled in, you know, you know, long sleeve button up white shirt with a tie all the way tied suspenders, you know, probably the hottest. <laughs> yeah, it looked uncomfortable. Yeah. Same thing with, uh, IRS, IRS. Yes, he, 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 he wore the short sleeves though, because he was, you know, he's supposed to be halfway dorky because he was, you know, he well, worked for yeah. the IRS. Could I put in an honorable mention sure. for Ray Trailer? Yeah. The both as Big Bubba Rogers and his yeah. career as the big boss man. Yeah. Uh, in the prison outfit. Yeah. Often, well, I mean, what else would the big boss man wear? I mean, like right. it, it wasn't like you're going to put him in a singlet with a badge on it. I mean, that right. wouldn't make any sense, no. right? It had it had to look like a uniform. And it did, and it really. I mean, that made that character. Even sometimes he would have like a leather... No, like the leather belt thing. Across, yeah, across yeah. his shoulder kind of thing. It was really a great presentation. And, you know, you believe this was that, you know, the bad prison guard from, from Cobb, Cobb County, County Georgia. Georgia. That's right. Thank you. Shout out to Cobb County there. <laughs> <laughs> but that made a tremendous uh, presentation. And that's really part of what it is. You're trying to get across to the audience who who you are as the performer. Yeah. And, it really makes them memorable. Is that fair to say? Yeah, and that, and it also comes back to the John Cena thing. It, you know, would it have worked with anyone else? I mean, yeah, there was guys like Public Enemy and, and PG-13, and, like, there was lots of people that did that kind of thing, but John Cena became a megastar, you know, so he got that over. You understand? If you, as long as you get something over, it doesn't matter. You know what I mean? Like, before we started the podcast, I was telling you about, you know, I, I used to love the Jeff Jarrett gear. You know what I mean? Like right. everyone else hated it with the with the, the choker the thing, thing and the straps and the straps coming, coming down, down the chest. chest. Yeah, yeah. yeah, everyone else hated. It. I love that. I thought, oh, that's unique. That's great. I love that. You know, same thing with um, we have a wrestler around here uh, named Poker Face, and he used to wrestle with one leg. leg yes, one leg. <laughs> as soon as you leg mentioned long it, tights, and the other leg was a yeah. biker short. Well, as soon as you mentioned length. the name, I knew where you were going right. because I remember that clearly. I've watched him wrestle many times. Yeah, but I mean, like, and then Zack Ryder used that in WWF some, but I mean, a lot of people have used that over the years. But that's just something I always found I liked and was something unique to to them. You know, um, you know, some people, you know, like they they have a good body. Well, they have a good body shape, but maybe they just when they get trunks, they need to have them above their belly, above their belly button, so it makes them look bigger instead of you know having their belly hang out. So it's just look like Terry Bam Bam Gordy. You know, he used to wear his trunks over. His right, face. very high. Doctor Death Steve Williams, same thing. You know, right, those guys look like monsters. You know, because, and they were, and they were. You <laughs> know, fair enough. Yeah, <laughs> but at the same time, you know, no one say all oh, those are just fat guys. You know, what I mean, like that would be completely. Uh, you know, wrong in that scenario because those guys were uh, able to kill just about anybody. 
All right. Well, if I could slip in a little bit, that was one of the things that I always I went back and forth in my mind about John Cena. John Cena was obviously someone who was very known for his physique. Yeah. He he was a you know he always came to himself in tremendous shape. He was known you know. Yeah. Uh, and so it always seemed odd to me that almost you might not be capitalizing because you know on his physique by having him covered up by the baggy jorts and so forth. Right. But. Very what, but we we talk about too that um, wrestling. This is from my one of my favorite quotes ever from R- Rick Rude. Uh, wrestling is an upper body business. Yes. You know, so leg. You know, people are talking about leg day, leg day, leg day. No, <laughs> people are just looking at your torso, man. They want to see the big arms and the big chest and the, and the traps like Road Warrior Hawk and things like that. So it's an upper body business. Well, Rick Rude. Speaking of ring attire, yeah. there is a name who became quite famous for the use of airbrushing yeah, so, on his on and that's his what I'm saying, like, and you look at that like Rick Rude got that over so did uh, Rob Van Dam and then Ryback eventually you know used it as well I mean there's there's been a, a plethora of people that use that too well the the manner in which Rick Rude used it oh yeah cuz he used it for storyline purposes because he would do the face of someone significant to his opponent yeah and <laughs> the Cheryl Roberts one obviously being the, yes, the, the that, most famous one. those stick out and it's like Oh, he did that. And then he did the one where I, I think it was him on one ass cheek and then Cheryl Robinson. And then, <laughs> then he clenched them play. together and they kissed. <laughs> yes. That was that was magnificent too. You see what I'm saying? Like that's that's good wrestling stuff. Like it's not vulgar. You know understand? But no. it, it's still got a little connotation it, to it. It, it uh but it, it implied vulgarity. It impl- exactly. How's that? It implied vulgarity and, and the fact that, you know, <laughs> here's this he's hitting on another man's wife. And he's very clearly. Very clearly. Wearing, wearing the image of another man's wife on your ring apparel in the ring. Uh, if I, I, I know time is drawing near, but I did want to get in one honorable mention. You mentioned about someone getting something over. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm calling back to Dusty Rhodes with this. Dusty Rhodes was someone who was obviously known um, during his NWA and WCW days as a serious competitor. And then when he came to be a part of the WWF, he began appearing in the ring wearing polka dots. And I know a great many people did not care for the, including myself, did not care for this at the time. But I think it's fair to say that he got it over. Yeah. Is that fair? Yeah. I mean, I think they gave it to him as a rib. Like, oh, he's, he's you know, he's Dusty Rhodes. He's, he's the booker of Crockett. He's, you know, former NWA World Heavyweight Champion. He's this, he's that. Let's put him in polka dots. Right. Well, yeah, let's put him in. We'll pay him a bunch of money. It don't matter. Let's put him in polka dots. And then we'll sell him on the polka dots. And he fucking went out there. And like you said, he got it over. Like, okay, watch this. I'm going to dance and, and do all this right. jive stuff. And I, I mean, and I it worked. just see him and Sweet Sapphire. Sweet Sapphire. Sapphire. And Sapphire was a um, – uh, she was a lady that used to hang around. I think they said the Kansas City area, and she would, you know, she would pick the guys up from the from the airport. She would go get them food or like if they needed anything. She was kind of like just a run around person like that. And then eventually, somehow, they thought she'd be good for that that spot. So like she ended up, and I think she made some good money. You and know, she did a tremendous job. Yeah, with she, I mean, she did. Her job. There was a there was a mixed tag match with with her and Dusty versus Sherry Martell and and Randy Savage. Right at a SummerSlam, I think it was, or maybe it was a Mania. Yeah. I can't remember. But either way, um, yeah, yeah, and like like you said, you know, um, the polka dots. He he got them over. Like even even if it was a rib, if you turn around and get it over, then everyone wins, right? Well, to this day, when people kind of try to pay homage to dusty roads i often see the polka dots involved and that and you know and, and the thing about that thing is too is like it's one of those things like you see how powerful the wwf machine is sometimes when they're able to make that stuff synonymous like do we talk about terry taylor now without talking about the red rooster it's hard to ignore it exactly because it has such a big the the reach of wwe is so far you understand? Like, so when we talk about Dusty, polka dots come to mind. When we talk about, you know, Terry Taylor and the, and the Red Rooster stuff. I mean, it's just, um, it just, it just always comes back to that. But like you said, we, uh, we're over time. We're never going to be exactly on 30 minutes. We'll always be a little bit over. We actually went uh, pretty long on this subject, believe it or not. You know, we thought we might be short changed <laughs> on this one, but we actually, uh, made it work. So, for the Golden Boy Greg Anthony and my co-host, the mad scientist, Mark Tipton, thank you and goodbye.